If you will, turn in your copy of God's Word. You can remain seated. But just turn in your copy of God's Word to Romans chapter 5. We've now made our way into uh, the fifth chapter, finishing out chapter 4 last week, obviously. And originally I had planned to go all the way through verse 11. But have you ever had one of those rich pieces of fudge? My wife just made a whole pan of it. And you can only handle so much. (laughs) And so I had to cut us off at verse 5 for tonight. And we'll pick up in in verse 6 in January. But listen here as I read to begin our message tonight. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 5. Paul writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exalt in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exalt in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Do you notice the increasing joy at this time of year? I mean, things around Christmas time usually just get happier. The music on the radio is happy. The hymns that we sing are are cheerful and joyful. The food is sweeter. The fudge, the candy canes, the sugar cookies, the gingerbread, everything is just uh, much more sweeter in the things that we eat. The faces are brighter, especially the faces of children as they sing songs, as they play the piano, as they ring bells, as they think about Christmas trees and the lights that are on the house and the thoughts of the gifts that they will get and pictures of Santa. Things just become much happier this time of year. In American culture, Christmas is a season of happiness and cheer. But are these reasons to be joyful? Because what about when these things are taken away? What about when your Christmas isn't so happy? Maybe this is the first one alone that you've had after 50 years together with your spouse. What if this one isn't so happy because your bank account is much tighter this year than in years past? Or your family lives far away and isn't coming to visit this year. So where do we find our joy? Can we still find joy? What is our reason to rejoice? That's the question tonight. As we move along in Romans, continuing this expedition, I think it'll be helpful to review. We saw in the chapter 1, verse 18, through the middle of chapter 3, the problem of sin, right? And then in uh, chapter 3, verse 21, we had God's solution, our justification by faith alone, that turning point then of, but now. And then we've seen then Paul impact our pardon for sin uh, that has been given to us, imputed, <coughs> excuse me, to us, in Christ's righteousness, imputed to us, our sin to him and his righteousness to us. So what is our reaction to this great news? How should we then respond? Well, in chapter 5 here, Paul's going to tell us, the Bible says that we should burst forth in jubilant praise, that we should exalt in God. And so tonight, in these first five verses, we will see three reactions of joy to our justification. Three reactions to joy, or of joy, in our justification. The first is found here in verse 1 and the first part of verse 2. We react with joy due to our peaceful position. When we think about why we have joy, our first reaction due to our justification 
is that we should react with joy due to our peaceful position. Look at verse 1 here again with me. We see the, the great transitionary word here, therefore, connecting us to everything that is proceeding, connecting us to our justification and the unpacking of that and the example that we have of that in the Old Testament through Abraham. Paul now says, therefore, in response to, as a result of, because of our justification by faith. Therefore, having been justified by faith. This is a finished work. It is done. It has been completed, and there is an ongoing result in our life. And I hope that by now, all of us that have been on this expedition know what that means. This is the gospel. Our justification by faith is the gospel. And if you are just joining us tonight, if you haven't been here, if this is the first time, this is the essence of, This is the essence of what God has done. This is redemption in our life, knowing that all men are sinful. You and I, all of us born into this world, are born into sin. And we have a problem that you and I cannot fix. No amount of hard work, no amount of righteous doing, no nothing can solve that problem for us in our own doing. Because we have angered God And we can do nothing to change that. But God knowing that, God knowing in his rich mercy, in his love towards us, in his extension of grace to us, he sent the God-man. He sent Christ, the one whose birth we celebrate at this time of year. He sent him to live that perfect life attaining the law, the only one that could save himself by doing all the right things because he was the only one who could and then at his death on that cross took the punishment that you and I deserved. Taking our sin and in turn his righteousness, his life that he lived in perfect obedience to the law, being counted, being credited to us. We are then declared righteous in the courts of God. We've been justified. And the means that we experience that, what connects us to that event in human history is the faith that God gives us, the opening of our eyes, the regeneration, and us trusting in Christ with confidence, with assurance that his ransom was enough to satisfy the wrath of God and the need of us sinners. That's justification by faith alone. That, beloved, is the gospel. And if you don't know it, if you haven't embraced that, if you haven't responded in repentance to your sin and faith in Christ, then I would, I would love to, to talk with you after the service. I would love to, to explain that more fully. I would love a phone call, a coffee, any time to come. I will draw in the middle of the night. This is something that I will never, never deny a conversation about. But this, beloved, is the gospel. And it's important that we know that. It's important that we have this connection and this understanding because without this, then these reactions of joy cannot be experienced. The following three points, the first being our peaceful position, cannot be experienced. However, Because of this, because of this, because of our justification by faith, there's been a change in our eternal position. This should erupt in us an expression of praise. We should exalt in God because there has been a change in our eternal position. Remember what we saw before and what I just explained is that God had been angry with us because of our sin, because of our disobedience. His wrath was rightly poured out upon us. But now, beloved, now because of our justification by faith, our standing, our position with God is no longer one of wrath, but now one of peace one of peace we've come to terms with god look here therefore not having been justified by faith we have peace with 
God. The war is over between the believer and God. We are no longer raging against him in our sin, and he is no longer giving us over to our sin. The believer no longer is under God's wrath. That anger has been turned away from us, and we are now under his grace and mercy and love. His favor and blessing is now being poured upon us. We now, beloved, we now as believers stand in a peaceful position with God. Amen? Amen, amen. And I want to be clear here because in this picture of the war, we are at peace with God. And so the war against God, with God is over, but the war with sin is not. And we're going to get to that. Chapters 6 through 8 will really deal with those battles. But I just want to be clear here that the battle with God is over. As a believer, the battle has been won. We are now, our position now, our standing with God, where we stand with Him, is one of peace. One of peace. Wow, what a reason to rejoice. And what were the terms of this peace? How were these, what was the offer? We were at war with God and he set the terms that we come through our Lord Jesus Christ. And many want to set their own terms, don't they? Many, when they think of, well, I know that I have this problem with God, that I'm separated with him, and I want to come to him on my own terms. I'll have faith, but you can't ask me to move, God. I'll, I'll come to you in faith. I'll believe in Jesus, but I'm going to keep this drinking habit. Or I'm gonna, I'll, I'll say I'm a Christian, but just don't ask me to clean up my speech. Just don't ask me to be a changed person at work. I'll believe in Jesus. And also, but Buddha's pretty good too. And then that Islam thing, that's, they've, they've got something going there too. But no, Jesus sets the terms. We come to God through Christ. Those are the terms of peace. It doesn't work this way to make our own terms. There's no negotiating with God. There's no addendums. There's no ands or buts or ifs or anything. And that's really what chapters 1, 2, and the first part of 3 have taken away. We have no defense. We have no room to negotiate with the Lord. We accept his terms or we get nothing. The terms then come through Jesus and his righteousness. No other way in. No other way in. And I think it's very key here in the title that Paul gives the Messiah, that we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. His given name, Jesus, but also these two terms of his, the Lord and the Christ. It's very intentional. We come to him as Lord, submitting to his mastery, his lordship over our life. We come to him in obedience, knowing that we have, that there's a call, that there's a way of life, that he, we are his slaves and his subjects. And we also come through him as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the anointed one, trusting in his death and resurrection as the ransom payment for your sin, my sin, and our salvation. And this is the only way in. We come to peace with God, to this peaceful position through the Lord Jesus Christ, who acts as, look at the first part of verse 2 here. How do we get in? He has been our introduction by faith into this grace. Many of us have been to a wedding party, haven't we? Or maybe some other party or event that required an invitation from the host. Right? You've got one of those, maybe had an RSVP, and in order to get into this event, to go to the reception, you had to bring this this card. You had to know the host. You had to know the person coming. Otherwise, the guards at the door wouldn't let you in. No invite, no entry. And you could maybe try to plead with the guard to let me in. You know, I know so and so. Hey, that guy's going in. I know him. That's, he's my dad. You know, oh, I've, I've met the host before. I've talked about him. I've, I've read about him in a book, in a magazine, right? 
We try to talk our way in. Or, hey, you want to let me in. Look, you, you, you don't know who I am. I've, I've done a lot of great things. I have this great title, all this business acumen. I have all these great things. I know these other guests at, the other, at this party. And, and because I'm going to be here, that'll bring a whole bunch of other guests. But no matter how much we try to, to weasel our way in, no matter how we try to persuade the guard without knowing the host, no getting in just a wedding crasher then no it won't get you anywhere and so is the case into this grace into this peaceful position the only way in is through jesus access we've obtained our introduction our approach to god the father is made through jesus there's no way that you or i could stand before the father any other way but then covered by christ's righteousness he is our introduction into this uh, by faith into this grace which we now stand you want to stand in grace with god well it's going to come by faith on jesus merit on what he did in his righteousness jesus has to come along inside and say he's with me i vouch for him i present him to the father This is my chosen. This is the one I have bought. This is the one I have ransomed. You come to this through Jesus. Not us, beloved. If you are found in Christ tonight, what a marvelous truth that Jesus stands there presenting you to the Father, saying, He's with me. So we have this introduction into this grace in which we stand. We stand in it. Here we stand. And so we ask the question, well, how do we stand? We stand presently, right now. This is not something future to be attained. Your justification, the declaration of righteousness on your life is something that you and I, brothers and sisters, stand in presently. This is not something that one day we will will attain. This is not a blessing that we will attain in the future. But you and I, as God's beloved, stand today justified as His children. And there is nothing that can take that. Because we not only do we stand presently, we also stand presently. Firmly, nothing can change this. We've been declared righteous. It has been both declared and decided. It is secure. Our position is one in which we stand presently. It's one we stand firmly in. And it's one we stand perfectly in. Because this is not in your and my righteousness. This is in Christ's righteousness. And His righteousness was perfect without blemish, without stain. We stand perfectly now. This justification is not partial. It is not a process. It is complete. We stand now declared righteous. Nothing can take it. Nothing can change this peaceful position. You will not go. The terms will not change. Your position with God will not go from enemy to friend. From, uh, you are standing perfectly now, presently, firmly. But we also stand humbly, don't we? We stand humbly, not with a cavalier heart, not with a boastful heart, heart and our own actions but we stand in the grace of god we stand in this peaceful position in our justification knowing we did not earn it and we did not deserve it and so we stand firmly perfectly presently and humbly And lastly, I would say, here we stand joyfully. Here we stand joyfully. What else could elicit this eruption of joy and praise and boasting and glorying in the God, but standing in peace with God? What else compares to that? What gift could you receive? What what benefits could you receive? What promotion could you receive that would compare to being at peace, perfectly, presently, firmly in with God right now? 
What does Santa have to offer that could compare with being standing in peace with God? Nothing. Nothing. We react with joy in a season like this, knowing this truth that we've been justified, that we now stand in a peaceful position with God. What great joy. But it doesn't stop there. There's three reasons to react with joy, right? That's just the first. The second reaction, we react with joy due to our promising prospects. Due to our promising prospects. Not only is there great joy presently in our perfect position, but we also look forward to the future. There's been a change in not just our eternal position, but there's been a change in our future destination and restoration. Look at the second half of verse 2. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. We exalt, this exalt, it can also be translated boasting, glorying, rejoicing. This is an eruption of praise and joy. We know that bad boasting is when, we have, when are the object of our boasting is off, when it's in ourself. We don't boast in that manner. Hey, look at me and how great I am. That is bad boasting. But good boasting is this exaltation when God is the object and his accomplishments are the object of our boasting, of our glorying, of our rejoicing. And so here, this second eruption of praise, our second reaction of joy is in our promising prospects. It says we exalt in hope. This is a hope we know. There's a future element. There's a future expectation of something great that's yet to come. And so we ask, well, what is it? And he says, of the glory of God. You may remember Romans 3.23 when the opposite of of this was mentioned, that we all fall short of the glory of God. And now, after this, after the but now, after our justification by faith alone, we we don't fall short anymore because now we exult in the hope of the glory of God. What was once our, our damnation is now our great expectation. We hope in the glory of God. This is something to look forward to, something that we will one day experience, that we will have a future share in, the glory of God. We await our future glorification to again be made both good and great, where moral perfection will be restored to us. And we will also, the greatness will be restored to the glory that Adam lost when he sinned. What a day that will be. What a day that will be. And this is just a small phrase here. And and Paul's going to unpack this much further in chapter 8. It's, it's great here. Now we've, we've kind of turned the corner. He's explained justification and now our, our reactions to justification by faith and how we live today. And in chapter 8, he's really going to unpack this further. Flip over a few pages and look at verses 28 and 30. Romans 8, 28 and 30 here. Where Paul is going to show the unbreakable chain of salvation that when you experience one of these things, you experience all of these things. Romans 8.28 is probably a very familiar verse, a solid foundation on which to rest our lives in the sovereignty of God. And so just listen here as I read this. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined 
to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. What an incredible promise for the believer here. That those, here Paul is saying, that those who've experienced his justification, who stand presently at peace with God, we also look forward to our glorification. We look forward to this because this is going to happen. Just as it is sure that we now stand at peace, it is sure that one day, one day, the restoration of the goodness and the greatness that was meant to be in human will be restored. And this we await. This we await. No matter what terrain is ahead on the horizon, there lies a blessed hope. No matter what is the, in that process of being conformed to the image of his son, there lies a blessed hope on the horizon. The prospects are bright. The end is incredible. And this should really fan the flames of our joy as we look ahead. This should really elicit this eruption of praise in us as we look ahead and not behind. As believers, we stand presently in our secure justification and we look forward to that coming secure glorification. We don't look at what's behind And maybe some of us are looking at what's behind. Maybe some of us do stand today justified. Maybe some of us have glorification on the horizon. But for many of us are just looking at what's behind. We can't seem to shake that past sin. We can't seem to shake off those things that were once in our past that are no longer held against us. I would just encourage you that if you're tempted to despair then I want you to exclaim in depression's face, I stand in peace with God and I boast in the hope of the glory of God. I want you to say, if you are questioning your salvation, I want you to proclaim to those doubtful feelings, I stand in peace with God and I boast in hope of the glory of God. If Satan is trying to condemn you of your past sin, you retort with boasting, I stand in peace with God and boast in hope of the glory of God. We look forward Beloved, we exalt in hope that lies ahead. We react with joy due to our peaceful position. We react with joy due to the promising prospects. But it doesn't end there. Verses 3 and 5 take a somewhat unexpected turn. It's not really where we think Paul would be going here. But he's going to take us from the heavenlies from our our position and our prospects back to an earthly experience. And things just are getting real now. Things are going to get tangible. Things are going to get all too familiar. You might think, well, and not only this, that Paul's going to, in verse 3, and say, and not only this, but life is going to be easy and carefree. Not so. Not so. But rather, our third point is we react with joy due to our purposeful pain. We react with joy due to our purposeful pain. There has been now a change in our perspective. Where there was a change in our eternal position, there is a change in our future prospects, there has also now been a change as a result of our justification in our perspective in this life. What was previously punishment for sin and a consequence of the fall now has a spiritual purpose. This is why Paul says, and now we also exult in our tribulations. Same word, same boasting, same glorying, same rejoicing in the hope of the glory of God. But verse 3, not only this, but the same eliciting of erupting of praise to God 
and what awaits us in the future, we also have the same reaction in our tribulations, our trials, afflictions, burdens, troubles, anguishes, persecution, and spirit. Tribulations literally mean to be pressed together. You might think of like a vice squeezing the boards together, pressing them together, holding them in place, or a mortar and pestle in the kitchen, pressing together those herbs, grinding them into dust. It's that tight feeling that you get in the chest, the pressure that you feel. That's literally what this means. And it's interesting here that Paul, in the same way, he has this progression that happens in our tribulations because tribulations produce something. It's a process. And this is really similar. This is, this is true of, of most all sections in the New Testament on, on tribulations. Is it comes in a, in, a, in, a sequ- in a sequence, in a progression. James 1 has one. 1 Peter 1 is that there's this progression. And trials and tribulations are a part of our sanctification, right? This process of becoming holy, And so, of course, this is going to be a process. And so we ask the question, well, what's the purpose in the pain? How does our perspective change? And so let's look at this this procession here. We know that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. Perseverance, it's a word that I think we're familiar with. It's that endurance, the staying power, the steadfastness. It's being toughened up to withstand storms. And without experiencing these things, well, then we don't have to. Without storms, without trials and tribulations and burdens, we can just live a, a, a fat and happy life. But you don't know how you will stand up to storms until you actually experience it. And so when you're in tribulations, this is what produces that perseverance. You don't know how long you can run and and how far you can go until your feet hit the pavement and you begin to go. And you persevere through the pain. But it doesn't just stop there because that perseverance produces or brings about a proven character. Being tested by fire. It's where your character is given a stamp of approval that this is genuine, this is pure, this is a believer, this is, and really here, the tribulations, tribulations and our response to them are the chief evidence of your justification. You want your peaceful position to be shown? How firmly you do stand? Then tribulations are going to come to prove that and to prove your character. After enduring storms, this tested character develops that wasn't there previously. It's a maturing, there's a growth that happens. There's a focus on what really matters. It produces a sobering effect of proven character. When you're stripped away of all the superfluous things in your life, what are you left with? Proven character or rotten character? Or do you stand justified with God or is your, is your standing with God one of unpeace, one of war. Where do you go? Has the storm knocked you off your feet? But the progression doesn't stop here. The perseverance brings about, produces proven character, and the proven character brings about hope. These first two, perseverance and proven character, are the two that prove that hope in the future glory is real. And this is not just an illusion. That this is not just something that is in our mind. But this is when we endure through tribulations and we endure through trials. It shows that our hope in the future glory is real is manifest, that this is not just something that has been conjured up, that it shows that we can be confident that justification and our glorification are certain because of this response to the pain, this response to the persevering through these trials. Responding in joy 
And boasting in the face of trials shows a changed nature. Whereas before Christ, before we've been justified, before our status has changed with God, when we experienced those tribulations, our response was only bitterness and anger. We would just become mad, mad at God, mad at the world. But rather, this solidifies our hope. Because what? Hope does not disappoint. Literally, it does not put us to shame. You do not have to be worried about the tribulations that you are facing or because God is mad at you, because God is punishing you, that you need to be ashamed of what you've done or anything. This does not disappoint. Trials and tribulations don't weaken our faith. They strengthen it. It's not a a cause for questioning and cowering. Because we can face them with an element of boasting, knowing that the pain has a purpose. We can exclaim, come what may, thy will be done, Lord. My position is secure and my future is promising. Come what may. Why can believers react this way? Why can we react this way? How do we do it? Because this is contrary to our nature. This is not something that our flesh does. When we're in trial, when we're in temptation, when we have burdens and we're crushed in spirit, our reaction in our flesh is not one to say, praise God. But our flesh reaction wants to lash out in anger, in bitterness, in why me, in pity, in in doubt, and, and everything else. But why can believers react this way? Look at verse 5. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Why can believers react this way? Well, in a nutshell, because the Holy Spirit lives in us. And it is better that Jesus left to accomplish redemption and give us the Holy Spirit, that we are now led by the Holy Spirit and we can walk in the Holy Spirit. We no longer have to just walk in the flesh. We are not slaves to reacting that way, but we can now react according to the Spirit who was given to us. But let's break this down a little bit. Because the love of God... This is the first time in Romans that Paul's mentioned the love of God. This is God's love for us. His love for us has been poured out, has been lavished upon us, has been given to us in abundance, that we have beyond measure of God's love poured out within our hearts. This is the experience of our justification. This is the experience of our peaceful position with God. That we experience his love in us, that the trials drive us closer to the Father. I mean, think about it like this. If you're experiencing a trial, especially if, as if you're a young child, or maybe you can think back to being a child, how do you know the Father's love, your dad's love better for you? When you're in a time when, of sadness or trial, do you know his love better talking to him over the phone? or when you're curled up in his lap, close to his heart, hearing the words whispered in your ear. You know the love of the Father. When you're close to him, he's dwelling within us now. The love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, God's active ministry to our inner man. Him living inside us, Him affirming our salvation, Him proclaiming within us when our flesh is at war with the Spirit, saying, no, you are secure. No, you have been bought. No, your future is promising. And again, this is really going to be unpacked more in Romans chapter 8. Turn back over to 8 again in verses 15 to 18. I want you to see this, Romans 8, 15 to 18, where Paul says here, for you have not received, remember the Holy Spirit that has been given to us, here he's talking to believers, but you have not received a spirit of slavery 
leading to fear again. Trials and tribulations, you don't have to respond in fear. But you have received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also. Heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him. So that we may also be glorified with him. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Here it is said again in another way, that a parallel to this. This is why believers can respond to trials this way. Because the Holy Spirit has been given to us, lives within us, that we can react in such a way. To sum up this point, believers can react with joy to purposeful pain because the Holy Spirit lives in us. Blaming God, bitterness, anger is really signs of an unregenerate heart. There's no Holy Spirit inside. And, and don't misunderstand me here. I don't want to say that in trials that, you know, we're jumping for joy and woohoo, yeah, bring it on, you know. That's not what, that's not what I mean. I mean, we, don't, we can respond contrary and say, praise God in the pain. Praise God in the pain. But when disease, death, or the devil attack, how do you react? When disease, death, or the devil attack, How do you react? We have a great illustration here in our church. Elder Bill Leip has been under attack. And have you noticed since this pronouncement, he's probably melting that I'm even bringing him to the forefront. But I can say imitate him as he imitates Christ. Because since this, there has not been a man whose the joy of the Lord has been more evident in. That though disease has come on the attack, his reaction has been one of purposeful pain. He has joy. He has assurance in where he's going. He knows where he stands with the Father. As you speak to him, the truths of God's word are being made more alive to him. He stands secure. He stands assured. And the Holy Spirit is living inside him. And he is the first to admit that. Praise God, the Holy Spirit lives in him. This is a man who stands justified. A man who whose future glory awaits him as it does us, a man whose pain is purposeful. What about you? What do you boast in this Christmas? Is it in fleeting finances, fading fads, or forgotten furnishings? Or is it, or is it in your peaceful position, your promising prospects, and your purposeful pain. This season at Christmas, where joy and happiness and cheer are around us, let your joy be found in your justification, therefore having been justified by faith. React with joy. And I just want to encourage you in closing, since we won't be meeting for several weeks over this joy-filled season, over Christmas, I would just really encourage you to take each of these three points, starting with your peaceful position this week and focusing on that. Next week during Christmas, focus on the promising prospects 
And the week after that, beginning on the 28th through the end of the year, through purposeful pain. And just begin to reflect on that. Think through the verses uh, that speak to these things. Memorize this passage, maybe. But I would just really encourage you to take one of these and make it the focus of your joy this week. If you have children in your home, if you're with your family, if you have family coming in from out of town, show your family that the joy of Jesus, that the joy found in justification, in the redemption that he bought, that he came into this world to, with his sole purpose to accomplish is far greater than that that any Santa or any material thing or any gift or any candy or any sweet or any music could bring about. That the joy of Jesus is far greater than Santa. The joy of our justification is far greater than anything you will experience here on this earth. Let's take that back. Let's redeem the joy of this season based on our peaceful position, our promising prospects, and the purposeful pain. Let's have a joy in just that. What a passage. What an eruption of praise. And so I think it's fitting now that as we close, that we sing joy to the world. What a great song that we sing, a familiar favorite song that we sing around Christmas time. But as we close now, let's close with this song. Let's sing all the stanzas, number 125, but it's on the screen here and just behind us, I believe. But let's stand and sing joy to the world.